Now, what I thought I'd do today is just talk a little bit about uh, where I th see things mo moving uh, politically, economically around the world, and try to give you a sense of how uh, my thinking about the world uh, has changed over the last few months, because I think for anyone to look at this extraordinary crisis we're in and, and pretend that uh, that they haven't give, you know had some second thoughts uh, would be foolish. Uh, I, I, I'm struck by this when I think about just the dilemma of our uh, our president. You know, here's a guy, a uh, couple of months into the United States Senate, when he decides to run for the presidency. And when he decides to run for the presidency, the, the globe is experiencing a global boom like it has never had before. The Dow Jones is at 14,000, remember that? Uh, and the only problem that is really occupying the minds of the political class and therefore the presidential candidates is how do we get out of Iraq? That was it. And now here he is four weeks in his, into his presidency, about to deliver his State of the Union address, and he faces the worst financial crisis since 1929, the worst economy <clears throat> since the Great Depression, a genuine global synchronized recession that might well turn into a depression if we are not careful, uh, and all the other problems that occupy presidents in Iraq that uh, is perhaps moving tentatively along, and Afghanistan that is moving decidedly uh, in a downward spiral, Pakistan that is uh, in, in, uh, been entrapped in that downward spiral, Iran, North Korea, uh, uh, you name it. And you do wonder sometimes whether President Obama gets up some mornings and says to himself, remind me again why I wanted this job. <laughs> but I, I think that the reality is we face a very unusual set of challenges. But what I want to suggest to you uh, is that the challenges we face are, ironically, the product of success. Uh, and they're the product of a specific series of successes that we have not figured out how to deal with. Now, what do I mean by that? If, if I were to start this story of trying to explain how we got into the mess we're in, I would probably choose as my date to start this story, 1979. 1979 is the year the 20th century ends and the 21st century begins to begin. Why do I say that? 1979 is, is a year the United States is in very bad shape. It's just a few years after Watergate, Vietnam, uh, the, the takeover of the hostages. This is a time when the United States is beaten, humiliated around the world, and an era of stagflation and genuinely difficult economic times around the Western world. The Soviet Union is on the march almost everywhere, from Central America to Africa. Uh, and it is also flush with, uh, with revenues because oil in 1979 hit its all-time high, uh, uh, roughly, roughly speaking the equivalent of about $130 a barrel. It was only uh, exceeded last year when, when oil went up to about 147 very briefly, it turned out. Um, at that moment in 1979, the Soviet Union makes one catastrophic mistake. It invades Afghanistan. And in invading Afghanistan, the Soviet Union digs the grave of its empire, but also of its existence as an independent entity on the globe and as a political economic system. And in doing so, the Soviet Union changes the dynamics of global politics and economics in a way that seems irreversible. Now, the reason is that the, the Soviet Union was not just the geopolitical rival of the United States uh, around the world, that it was, but it was also the alternate model uh, of political and economic development around the world. You know, I grew up in India, and in India in the 1960s and 70s, people really thought of the world as arrayed along a kind of spectrum. There was the US model for growth development uh, for economics, which was free markets, free trade, capitalism, and then there was the Soviet model on the other side, uh, state planning, central planning, socialism. And most countries arrayed themselves along that, that spectrum, one, way, one side or the other. And most countries, by the way, placed themselves much closer to the Soviet Union than they did the, the United States. India, Brazil, Egypt, the vast majority of countries in some way or the other thought of themselves as practicing a more moderate, perhaps democratic, tamer version of Soviet socialism about 15 countries clustered around the North Atlantic and a few countries in East Asia 
were closer to the United States. When the Soviet Union collapses in 1989, 1990, that spectrum collapses. And all of a sudden, you have really only one game in town. Now, I know Frank Fukuyama spoke to you earlier, and Frank looked at that scene, and I think quite brilliantly conjured up this idea that it was the end, end of history. Whether or not it was the end of history, I think there was no question that he identified a very powerful shift that had been ta taken place. For 200 years, people had been debating how to organize themselves in broad terms politically, in terms of their political economy. And in broad terms, it was a question about where the state's role, uh, function lay in the economy. And there were people on the left and there were people on the right. And that division between the left wing and the right wing, by the way, dates back 200 years to the, uh, to, the, to the positions of people sitting in the French National Assembly after the French Revolution. Those sitting on the left were considered left wing and liberal. Those sitting on the right were considered right wing uh, and, and conservative. That division seemed to be upended by the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you entered a world in which there was really one game in town.